feel about what's happening to our children in public schools. Yeah. Now, most of the time when I come over here, that's what I talk to you about because that's really where my life is centered. But it occurred to me that uh, Alton's been in this struggle uh, and I'm very concerned about how we're progressing in it. Uh, so I thought a lot about it, sisters and brothers, and uh, titled what I want to share with you tonight called Black People Still Don't Get It. For some time now, I have been trying to get the idea over that black people must take charge of their lives and those of their children. Um, we, we can't leave this to other people to do because they're not going to do it. And we cannot sit around wringing our hands and shaking our heads and talking. It's getting late, brothers and sisters, especially for our children. Now, when, the way, when it gets to the point that the way we live is destructive and leads to our extermination, then we have to think about what has happened to our culture. And we need to take a long, serious look at our condition now. Amen, go right there. If culture is the sum total of artifacts which any group accumulates in its struggle for survival and autonomy, yeah. then it's dynamic because it's a struggle. It's not static. It doesn't stand still and never change. It changes with the condition. Okay, because as you try to survive and to be self-autonomous and the conditions change that keep you from doing that, you change in order to combat those conditions. Yeah. Am I making sense to you? Yeah. Okay. Now, what is, what, is, what is survival? I mean, you know, what, survival means that the group has to do at, at least three things. One, the group has to see that each individual member keeps himself or herself in good enough mental, All right. moral, spiritual, mm -hmm. and physical health All right. long enough to reproduce that self oh. and then take care of whatever you reproduce. Oh. Yeah. That's the least. All right. if, you don't, if you don't do that, the group dies. It's gone. <laughs> okay. So that's what survival means. In order to be self-autonomous, it means that the group has to have within its control the means to assure its survival. Well, All right. You can't depend on nobody else to do that. All right. That's not going to happen. That's not the way the world works. Now, what are the chief obstacles to survival? Okay. Let's just be real. What are they? One is nature. You got to have within the means of the group some way for the group to survive earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, whatever. All right. right? So nature is one. Other men and women who might want to take your land, water, means of survival. All right. And yourself. All right. You can't become no cotton picking drug addict, alcoholic, and kill yourself. All right. right? Well, that's right. Okay. Those are the obstacles. Now. The culture that we pass down from generation to generation is supposed to help the group to survive and to be self-autonomous. The major way that we pass this culture on is through what? Groups, family, right. church, All school, right. organizations like this. All right. Those are the means. OK, now, unfortunately for us, we live in a country where the overriding values of the country are against us. Mm -hmm. For instance, these overriding values put in the positions of privilege, mm -hmm. people who are white, All right. people who are male, mm -hmm. and people who are wealthy. All right. And these three groups dominate the society. Mm -hmm. 
So when we talk about teaching our children instrumental values like equality, liberty, fraternity, etc., we are talking about ordering those values under the institutional values of race, gender, and wealth so that more white people get equality, liberty, and fraternity than black people, more men get equality, liberty, and fraternity than women, and more wealthy people get equality, liberty, and fraternity than poor people. You get it? All right. All right. All right. It doesn't do enough then, ladies and gentlemen, for us to teach our children about the instrumental values, you know, if we don't teach them the impact of the institutional values on the distribution of the latter. Otherwise, our kids don't get the full message and don't know how to behave. Now, when I was a young woman looking for a job in 1947, the newspapers would advertise, no Negroes need apply. Right. Chicago, Illinois, March 28, 1947. Chicago, Illinois, I did not say Mississippi. North, I was up north. All right. right. So what did that say? That said that at, in Mar on March 28, 1947, when I was looking for my first job, affirmative action was for white people. Now, just because we didn't call it that then, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't mean it wasn't. And now that it's our turn to have affirmative action, it's suddenly no turns, no turns. It's always our turn, right? It's always white people's turn for affirmative action. Nobody else gets a turn. So, so much for taking turns. But isn't that what we teach for two weeks in kindergarten? Oh, the teacher tells you, your child has to learn to take a turn. We teach him to take a turn in kindergarten. Take a turn in first grade. Take a turn in second grade. Wait your turn in third grade. Don't butt in fourth grade. Stay in line in fifth grade. When you get to be an adult, you stand and queue up at the cashier. Take your turn. Wait your turn. But nobody take no turns in this country. It's always the white man's turn. It's always the rich man's turn. It's always their turn. All right. So, so much for taking right. turns. In 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Plessy versus Ferguson, which legalized Jim Crow. And the overt racism that we knew as Jim Crow was forbidden. And most Negroes, now calling themselves black, thought the problem was solved. Black folks just didn't get it. We just didn't get it. We thought that the problem was segregation. But segregation was a symbol of the problem. The problem was this institutional value system of race, gender, and wealth. That's the problem. And ladies and gentlemen, it still is. The United States is not a democracy yet. It's trying to be, you know, trying to be. And I always tell my students when they say, I'm trying to do it, Ms. Sizemore, I say, come here. And I say, I'm trying to hit you. I'm, I'm trying to hit you, right? I'm trying to hit you. And then when I finish, I say, did I hit you? And he said, no. I said, so much for trying. But, but the United States is a capitalist country. It is that. Now, if it can be a democracy within the parameters prescribed by the capitalist paradigm, it does it. But when it can't, it won't. The basic premise of capitalism is to make a profit by any means necessary. And the unit of measure is the United States dollar. And ladies and gentlemen, it is taboo to teach this to your children. When I say taboo, I mean it's forbidden. For instance, if anybody gets up in front of a class and tries to teach the children about capitalism and how to be a capitalist, they are immediately labeled socialist or communist and run out of the, the room. 
right? It's a taboo. Don't you think that's strange? That in a capitalist country, we cannot teach our children to be capitalists? Oh, think about it. Because you see, in a capitalist country, you are either a capitalist or you are a victim. All right. well, There's no in-betweens. Right. There's no in-betweens. You either play the game here or you are a victim of it. Now, you have to make a choice. Of course, you can always leave the country. All right. That's another choice. All right? Now, capitalism demands competition selfishness and mean-spiritedness. It demands it. But what do they teach your children in school? Be cooperative. Be cooperative. Take your turn. Don't fight. Don't cheat. Now, everybody engaged in capitalism knows that the motto is win if you can, lose if you must, but always cheat. <laughs> and what I'm trying to explain to you, ladies and gentlemen, is the real world that our children live in, not the ideal one that we want them to live in, not this wonderful world that we pray that will come here one day, but the real world that they have to live in. You want to know why they're acting so crazy? You want to know why they're doing the things that they're doing? Because we have not prepared them to live in this real world. We have sent them through 12 years of school teaching them this dumb stuff that doesn't work, and when they go out and try to apply it and get killed for it, we are not there to help them too. All right. All right. We are not there. We fade away on them. Somewhere around about ninth grade, we start talking about, I can't control him. I can't do nothing with him. Get out of my house if you don't do what I tell you to do. And we abandon them to the mean streets and then cry because they get murdered. Capitalism is not compatible with equality. It is not compatible with equity. It is not compatible with Christianity, no matter how hard we try. All right. The struggle for survival in the United States is the handling of this never-ending tension between the institutional values of race, gender, and wealth, which give undue and unearned privileges and advantages to some so that others cannot compete on an equal basis for the resources of this country. All right. This is the game. This is the game, ladies and gentlemen. As Alton told you, politics is the management of the conflict which occurs when groups war over the resources. Resources include money, All right. land, right? So politics is just the passing around of the resources. Right. If you don't have the resources, as Alton told you, you're not in the game. Well. Black people just don't get it. All right. All right. We just don't get it. All right. Those who are at the bottom form a group which is bound by its cultural artifacts. That's language, religion, tradition, art, music, style, values. And these form a bond of cohesion which, if nourished, does become nationalism. All right. Right. But it has to be nourished. All right. And it has to be nourished by the group how do we do that? Family, church, school, organizations, right. institutions. Okay. All right. All right. When it becomes nationalistic, then the group is strong enough to create an economic niche in which the people can slide to make a living. All right. But under capitalism, you must be a producer. 
You cannot continue to be consumers. Right. African Americans spend more money than, well, there's one group that spends more money than us. We spend. Ladies and gentlemen, this means we do have money. All right. We spend it, right? So if you got money to spend, you do have money. This, this girl lost her father. She was in medical school when I was living in Pittsburgh. This young lady lost her father, uh, and he, he left enough money for her to go to school to finish her medical school, but it was in probate in the Pennsylvania court, and so she needed the money to pay her tuition right away. So she came to me and she said, could, do you think that you could get $5,000 from me to pay my tuition? And she needed it like in two weeks. So I went to my block club. We had a nice little block club, you know, all these little middle class people, professional people up on the hill. They're called Sugar Top in Pittsburgh. And I saw one around the block club and I said, can we get $5,000 together to get to this girl so she could get through school? And they used to come talking to me, but we haven't got that kind of money. Now I said, well, let's figure out some way to do it and we'll meet in three days. And so during that three days, I walked around in the six block area in which I live, which is called Sugar Top in Pittsburgh, and I just wrote down all the cars that cost more than $35,000. Now, now these cars, mind you, cost them more than $35,000 was sitting out on the street. They didn't have garages to put them in. So I went to the next three-day meeting and I had the long list of cars and I said, look, sisters, I said, look at all these cars that white people are parking in front of our houses. <laughs> because obviously, if we didn't have no money, we couldn't be buying $35,000 cars, right? Okay, so the sisters forked up the money and we gave it to the girl. But my point is that we say we don't have any money, but funny enough, we got money to buy all of these clothes and all of these cars and all these rings. I see, I see brothers and sisters with nine pounds of gold hanging around them talking about they ain't got no money. Well, I guess not if it's all on plastic. But that's another problem. That's another problem. You must try to be plastic free. Right. The plastic makes you a victim. The plastic makes you a victim. You will never participate in the capitalist process as a winner if you are a victim. All right. Then the brother came to me and he told me, he said, all this old capitalism crap you talking about, he said, you ought to shut up because we don't want to be engaged in capitalism. I said, show me your wallet. So he took out his wallet. I said, ain't no money in it. He said, no. I said, well, how you live? Where you live? Because I got to pay rent where I live. Where you live at? You can't pay, you don't have to pay no rent. What do you eat? Because every time I go to the Jewel, they want long green pictures of dead presidents. All right. I mean, hey, man, be real. You can't live in the United States of America without any money. That's right. I don't know a problem that our people have that would not be solved by more money. Right. Now, you, now, you see me afterwards. You see me afterwards, if you got a problem that money won't solve, because I want to know about it, because I'm making a list of them. All right. Because in a capitalist country, you see, that's the whole gig. That's right. That's the whole gig. The whole gig is to make everything cost money. That's right. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, everything is for sale. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Everything. That's Jesse Jackson. Now. <laughs> If you want to change things around here, I'm with you. I'm for you. But in the meantime, while you're changing, you got to eat. Because if you don't eat, you're going to be one dead revolutionary. All right. All right. So let's be real. I'm trying to stick to what's real, ladies and gentlemen. Because it's this tension between what's real and what's ideal that's killing our kids because they don't know how to deal with it. Okay, what's the problem here? The problem here is that the economy has been restructured. All right. So that the jobs that people used to get with little or no education have now disappeared. All right. In order to get one of those jobs, you now have to commute to Taiwan. All right. Or Mexico City. All right. All right. Or Haiti. You gotta commute for those jobs now, ladies and gentlemen. They're not in Brooklyn, okay? So those jobs are gone. So what are our people doing now that those jobs have disappeared? 
using their usual creativity to create new ones. But where is the opening for these new creative endeavors? In drugs? All right. We don't have a drug policy in the United States. I know you know better than that. Right. We don't have a drug policy. We got a prison policy, but no drug policy. 80% of the cocaine used in the United States is used by white people. Right. 80%. But look at television every night. Do you see them going to jail? No. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Because that's not the way the business is structured. All right. You see, drug, the drug industry is now a part of the gross national product. And they can't get rid of it if they wanted to. Everybody's, you know, mad at Kurt Schmoke because he said, uh, and uh, Joyce Lynn Elders because they're talking about legalizing drugs. How about nobody going to legalize drugs. You don't have to take those two people seriously. It's not going to happen because people make too much money off it. Not us. Not us. We're getting killed and going to prison. But that's part of the deal, too. Look at this, look at this capitalist plan now. Look at it. What did I tell you was to make a profit mm -hmm. by any means necessary. Right? Okay, how do you make a profit here? Well, you build the prisons. Right. Where are these prisons built? In New York City? No. In Brooklyn? No. Oh. oh, where are the prisons built? Who, who, who lives there? Okay, then who's going to build these prisons, ladies and gentlemen? Who's going to provide the guards in these prisons, ladies and gentlemen? I rest my case. All right. Going to provide jobs, both construction, maintenance. Okay. That's where the job's going to be in prison. All right. Now, let's look at where the money goes. A sociologist named Troy Duster at the University of California, Berkeley, has been studying the drug business. Troy is a brother. He's a sociologist. And what he noticed is that there are layers just like in any other hierarchy, right? right. The guys at the top, the guys at the bottom. Okay, as you come the top, the international cartel right. that runs the drug business, right. it's on top. Those are the international owners of the drug business. And then underneath them is a layer of international distributors. All right. These are the people that distribute drugs all over the world. Then underneath them, is a loose network of international bankers. All right. They launder the money All right. so that it can be distributed into legitimate business. All right. And it is this money that's fueling the economy now. All right. there you go. So if you're looking forward to drugs being disappearing, right. you are really naive. That's right. Black people just don't get it. That's right. They just don't get it. That's right. The bottom of the industry, the street industry, is run by poors, poor, poor black and Latino people. Or anybody else that's poor won't get in it. Now these are the people selling on the street, so they get caught and they get put in jail. Now, the part of the drug business that's used by the middle class elite gives you less time in jail than that sold to the poor. So as you come down the line from the international cartel, you get blacker and blacker and blacker, okay? And the punishment starts with the street level. All right. No bankers go to jail. That's right. No bankers go to jail. That's right. The field re regional representatives in the country, they don't go to jail. That's right. The couriers go to jail. Mm -hmm. The street distributors go to jail. That's right. The managers of the distribution in the poor communities go to jail. Yeah, that's right. Because it's easier to put them in jail. Mm -hmm. Because they have no group that helps them to survive. That's right. So these people come from the dysfunctional groups in the society. All right. These are the groups whose culture doesn't save them. All right. All right. Because the people haven't had enough sense to save their culture. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Black people just don't get it. All right. well, we just all don't right. get it. We all just right. don't get it. All right. Other groups come in this country, they get it right away. All right. And we get mad at them because they get it. All right. That's it. I've been away from Chicago for 20 years. I came back two years ago. I walked down, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe what I was seeing on 47th Street. The stores are all owned by Arabs and Koreans. 
These were stores that used to be owned by peop black people. Now none of them are. They work from dawn to, to sunset. They're in these stores all day long, selling us what we need. They have their families working in there. They don't hire nobody. People, right. Black people out there picking and talking about they don't hire no black people. Ain't nobody in there. Everybody's related. They're all family. I said, how you gonna get a job in there? You're not Korean, fool. That's right. That's right. You gotta be in their family to work there. That's right. When the Nation of Islam began buying up 79th Street in, the in Chicago in the 1960s, I thought we finally had gotten it. But this effort was lost in the usual ego struggles of African American men. All right. Ego struggles have spoiled more freedom efforts in my lifetime right. than I would care to stand up here and talk All to you right. about. Thank you very much. All right. All right. In fact, I have been involved in so many that now I just refuse to join another movement. That's right. We must learn to work together as a group. Alton talked to us about that tonight. I won't repeat it because he talked to us about that. We must learn to do this, ladies and gentlemen, because everybody does it if they get out of poverty in this country. They work together as a group. They work together as a group. If we are to survive and, the, and be autonomous in the United States, we must change our way of looking at living our culture is no longer functional because we've lost so much of the culture that used to save us. Our children are killing each other and us because we are not paying attention to what is happening to them. All right. Alton made reference to the prisons. That's the second part of the uh, uh, gross national product. In every state, they are building these prisons right. to put our people in, in order to get us out of the labor market, mm -hmm. and then to exploit us for providing jobs for them. Either way you look at it, going into the drug industry to try to be a businessman at the lower end where you get killed, or going to prison, we're still, once again, exploited, enslaved, used for others to become welcome, wealthy, so they can be rich. We spend a lot of time being resentful of Koreans and Hispanic people and Arabs who are trying to use this system the way that we should be using it. Now, why don't we do this? Let's look at that for a minute. All right. You remember when I told you about we tell our kids all the time in school, take a turn, but in the real world, you don't take a turn? Okay. We also teach our kids that there's something wrong with being separate. Mm -hmm. As soon as we get a little money, we want to be as close to white people as we can get. All right. We want to live in their neighborhoods. We want to go to their schools. We want to marry them. Yeah. We, want to, we, just, we just got the problem. All right. Right? We just have the problem. We don't like us. Right? Right. We don't like us. That's a big problem, ladies and gentlemen. It's a big problem. As soon as we get a little bit of money, we want to run away from us. Now, what do other groups do? They run together. And the first stage of that inclusion model is called separatism. And they come together because they have a common culture that saves them from these obstacles. Right? OK. We need to think about being separate. We need to stop being afraid of, be of nationalism, because we're afraid of it. All right, all right. We're afraid of it. Talk to us. And, and our enemies want us to stay afraid. That's it. All right. Because next to God, nationalism is the most powerful organizing force that man knows. All right, all right, all right. The most powerful, the most powerful is God. 
And if you don't believe me, look at the fundamentalist right, how they are driving abortion out of this country All right. without right. changing the law. That's right. How are they doing it? Killing doctors. All right. Shooting them. All right. See, that's what, that's what a powerful dynamic could do for you. If we had a powerful God dynamic, our kids wouldn't be killing each other. They might be killing somebody else, but it wouldn't be each other. That's it. That's it. That's it. But we don't have that. We don't have a powerful God dynamic. We used to, but we don't more. Next to that is nationalism. That's the next most powerful dynamic you have for organizing people. All right. Now, at one time, we had a model, and that was the Nation of Islam. And they were using it to death, mm -hmm. but Ego killed it. Mm -hmm. In her paper, Whiteness as Property, Harvard Law Review, June 1993, Cheryl I. Harris argues that whiteness is built on both exclusion and racial subjugation. Mm -hmm. And this is how she says it's used. Race has not only been constructed as race, but also as a privilege. That's why we got this hair problem. States, race is determined by visibility and reputation because there are over a million African Americans passing for white every day. And if you make friends with some of them, they will give you some powerful bits of information about the other folks that help you. Uh, and remember what Alton told you, information is power. Right? I seek them out at any institution I go to. I try to see if I can find out who's passing. <laughs> now, you can't tell on them now. That ain't the point. I want the information. Tell me what these doctors do in this hospital when they come in here. Tell me how they treat us when we come in here, because I want to know before I bring my mama over here. And they'll tell you. That's if you, you know, you don't turn them in. All right? OK. Harris argues that the decision to pass as white was not a choice if by that word one means voluntariness or lack of compulsion. She says that the fact of race subordination was coercive and circumscribed the liberty to self-define. In other words, because you are black, your ability to define yourself is limited in this. And passing for white frees you of that limitation. So she says if that is true and you want to define who you are, then it might not be voluntary. Now, my interaction with some of these people is that they passing for white in order to what? Survive. Survive and have self-autonomy. OK? Now let's look at the real world that makes you want to do that. And then think, let's think about those of us who can't if we wanted to. I mean, you know, you think I'd get away with it? I'd go out and say, I'm passing for white. Uh-uh. I don't think so. Self-determination of identity is not a right for us. It's not a right for us. But it's a privilege for white people, right? So the effect of protecting whiteness at law was to devalue those who were not white by coercing them to deny their identity. So I straightened my hair. I whitened my skin. I cut off my nose. I fix my lips. I cover up my heels and wear a girdle on my butt so I can look what? White. Because that's 
the identity that I want. Now this is the crux of the matter, ladies and gentlemen, for our children. And we have chosen, and I say chosen, because we didn't have to do this. We have chosen to destroy the main weapon for survival, which is our identity. Uh -oh. All right. And this has posed a severe problem for us and for our children. Because if I don't like who I am, I'm hardly going to raise a child who does. Mm, right. Because my child is a mirror of me. All right. All right. All right. The way out is through mobilization of the group to struggle for the survival of the individual. And you have to understand that black folks just don't get it. All right. I'm not giving up my individual right to sacrifice for the group. That's not what it's all about. Hey, the problem with that is the Constitution gives you individual rights, but you can only protect them as a group. All right. See, that's the problem. All right. All right. All right. That's the problem. Say that again. To survive, the group must ensure that each individual member is able to take care of himself or herself, reproduce himself or herself, and take care of the progeny. And we are losing the group function. It doesn't matter where. We're losing it in the family. We're losing right. it in the church. We're Thank certainly you. losing it in the school. Thank We're losing it in the community. Thank We're you. losing it in our institutions. Right. Our families are disrupted. Only 26% of all African-American children live with both parents. Our churches are predominantly female, 80%. Our schools are mostly dysfunctional. Children do not learn anything in them. All right. And our communities are disorganized. No leadership, no resources, no support. Black people still don't get it. We don't get it. We just don't get it. That it's the group function that's going to carry us through. It's the group function. Individual members working together as a group in order to take care of their own children, take care of their own poor and elderly, take care of their own disorganized and mentally ill. We can't even get control of the NAACP. This is our largest organization, and we can't even get control of it. We cannot even hire and keep the executive director of the NAACP. Mm. And this is no surprise. All right. Um, I don't know whether you're too young to remember or not, but I certainly remember when Julian Bond wanted Roy Wilkins' job and couldn't get it That's right. because of his position on Israel. Look at the African Americans chosen by President Clinton. Uh, Ask yourself if they represent you. No. Who recommended these folks? All right. What group? I don't think African Americans did it. Right. See, black people still don't get it. All right. We look at these black people on TV and we say, oh, President Clinton, he got a black man. Tell him, yeah, but who, who picked him? That's right. right. Whom does he represent? That's right. Not us. Every group through the pooling of its own resources, lifts itself up out of poverty. That's right. If you're waiting for Bill Clinton to lift you out of poverty, you still don't get it. That's you right. really don't get it. That's right. If you're waiting for the Black Caucus to lift you out of poverty, you don't right. get it. You still don't get it. Every group, through the pooling of its own resources, lifts itself up out of poverty. We keep expecting some other group to do it for us. It's never going to happen. All right. Black people still don't get it. We must, through the group function, build our own hospitals. I remember when I lived at 8622 South Wabash in a neighborhood called Chatham in 1969. Elijah Muhammad wanted to build a hospital on 83rd Street. The middle class blacks who were my neighbors in Chatham ran down to Mayor Daly and begged him to do something about this assault on our middle class community. And the mayor converted the desired area into a park. 
So instead of a black-owned hospital, we got a park. Later, the only black hospital in Chicago, Provident, closed. And then we had none. See, black people don't get it. They, they, they just don't get it. When I came back to Chicago in 1992, you know what I did, of course, was to immediately begin working with um, the schools. It was interesting um, for me to go back home. Um, those of you who know me know I started teaching Chicago Public Schools in 1947, and I, was, I taught every single grade. I started out as a Latin high school teacher in Wendell Phillips High School. Remember, I came up during Jim Crow, so I've never taught anything, anybody but, but African-American children. I'm, I came up during Jim Crow. I taught every grade. I taught Latin in high school. I taught educatively, mentally handicapped, primary and secondary. Span I taught English to the Spanish speaking. I taught every single grade. I was an elementary school principal and a high school principal in Chicago Public Schools. Then I was the director of the Woodlawn Experimental Schools Project, which was Chicago's uh, experiment with um, community control, like your um, IS-201. That's, that, I was director of that in, in Chicago. And then when the funding ran out for that, they put me downtown because they didn't want me back out in the field. So I was being punished. And I was given an assignment with um, this white man. I, I, I hated him. I'll just tell you the truth. Uh, I, I hate I try not, I try not to hate, because hate really destroys you. <laughs> um, but I, I hated this man. And, um, and, and the feeling was mutual, I understand, the feeling was mutual. Uh, so I wrote to the deputy superintendent, who was an African American, and I wrote him a long letter. I still have a copy of this letter, and I have his reply, because one day I'm going to put it in the book, although I might wait until he's deceased. And anyway, I wrote him a letter and, and asked him to move me out of here because of this racist man, and also he was to some other problems. And so, um, the African American wrote back to me and said there wasn't anything he could do to help me that, uh, you know, that I would just have to uh, get through it like everybody else did. And so I quit. I, I quit the Chicago Public Schools and left Chicago. That was 1972. And this white man went to jail. He, he's still in jail. Um, so when I got back home, um, in 1992, I started work with schools. I'm, I'm now the dean of the School of Education at DePaul University, and this is a strange place for me to be. It's a Roman Catholic university, and I'm Baptist. <laughs> uh, uh, when I first came, well, I, I was going to retire. Uh, those of you who know me know my mother had Alzheimer's, and I was trying to get home. I'm an only child. Uh, I did get home, thank God for her, her many blessings. I did get home in time before my mother died. Um, but anyway, um, I was retiring from the University of Pittsburgh. I was 65 years old and when this man told me this job was available. So I told him I really wasn't interested. I said, I'm not Roman Catholic and I don't want to spend the rest of my life in a Jesuit institution, you know, um, reviewing esoteric bodies of knowledge and all. So he said, oh, this is not a Jesuit school. Well. You know, I didn't, I'm not Roman Catholic, so that didn't have any meaning for me. He said, this is a Vincentian school, and I didn't know what that meant either. So he sent me a book about St. Vincent de Paul, who was the founder of the Congregation of the Mission, which is the order of priests who founded de Paul. He's a very interesting man, St. Vincent de Paul. One time in his life, he was enslaved, and he, he founded this mission to help poor people. And so when I, when I read his story, I said, well, at least I'll go talk to these people and see if this is for real or if this is, you know, like 9-11, just a joke. So I went in there to talk to them. I went to talk to them, and I found out that this, they really are for real. They have a feeding station there on Sheffield and Webster at the St. Vincent de Paul Church. And if you get there in the morning between 7.30 and 8.30, you'll see a line of like 50 to 100 black men coming in there to be fed and clothed. Um, they also have programs for juveniles and, and little children in the St. Vincent de Paul Center. So I said, okay, well maybe, you know, maybe God has blessed me and finally put me somewhere where I wanted to fight people to help poor people. And that is true. In the twilight years of my life, I'm in a job 
where I can without any apologies, anytime I want to help poor people. And so that's, that's what I did. Those of, you, those of you who know me remember when I got fired from my job October the 9th, 1975 as superintendent of the DC Public Schools that I promised God if she would help me find another job somewhere, you know, doing her will, that I would devote my life to doing that. And so this is where I am. Okay, so I have 10 schools. I have 10 schools that I work in, 10 schools that I work in. These are schools that are 100% African American or 100% Latino. The children are all poor and they're all low achieving. And my job is to elevate and accelerate student achievement in reading and mathematics as measured on standardized tests uh, for these children in these schools and we're trying to do it in one year. Now, since I've been back in Chicago, I've been having a big fight with the reform movement, which is largely white. Now, mind you, the school system there is 56% African American, 32% uh, Latino, and the rest white. But the entire reform movement is made up of elite white males. Uh, most of them are middle class or more. Um, what they are trying to do now is to abolish standardized tests in the schools uh, so that when they take the schools over, uh, when they privatize the schools, they will not have to be accountable to you. Now, there are several things that they're using to their advantage, and that is, first place, we suspect these tests. We always have. We have always been in the vanguard fighting the standardized test movement in this country. As all, we have always been in the vanguard of that movement. And we have always said, you know, back to Allison Davis, way back, 1940, that these tests are biased against poor people and against minorities. We have always said that. We have always said that. So this is not new to us. We understand that. So now they're playing on our suspicions. They're saying to us, oh, you know these tests are culturally biased? And we say, yes, yeah, sure enough, that's right. So they say, well, we want your support to abolish these tests. And we say, yeah, fine, you got it. And then they abolish the tests. Then they take the schools away from you and give them to the corporations. And then you will have no way of knowing whether your kid can read or not. That's right. You cannot hold them accountable because you don't know what they do. That's right. Okay, but, but let's look at the real world now that these kids got to live in. Do you think, do you think that DePaul is going to stop asking your kid to pass the SAT with the 1,000 score to get admitted? Do you really believe that? No. no. Right. Because if you said yes, black people still don't get it. <laughs> you still don't get it. Listen. Your kid, whether you abolish them or not, your kid is still going to have to take the SAT, the ACT, the MSAT, MCAT, the LSAT, and any other kind of T that they got going for them, they want to keep you out of a job. This, this system is not about to be test free because tests sort you out too effectively. This white reform movement is trying to sell you assessment by portfolio and calling it authentic in order to pull the wool over your eyes. Let me tell you, any time a test depends upon a white jury to tell you whether or not you are competent, you can believe it is not going to work for you. And if you think so, black people still don't get it. You just don't get it. You just don't get it, all right? Now, the only place in this society that you can get in by portfolio is prison. All right. You can't come to DePaul by portfolio. Right. You can't get in Harvard by portfolio. You cannot get a promotion in the Chicago police force by portfolio. You have to pass a standardized norm reference police test that you take with paper and pencil. Well. Ladies and gentlemen, the only place you get in by portfolio is prison. Now, if you do not understand it, you just don't get it. All right. You just don't get it. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, you just don't get it. All right. All right. So, we have this struggle going on in Chicago. In 1988, a reform group changed the law so that now principals are hired and fired by local school councils in every school, and we have 506 of them in Chicago. The principals have no tenure, but four-year contracts. 
Some schools have had four principals in the six years since the law passed, depriving these schools of leadership continuity without which nothing happens. And just like everybody else, if you do not train and educate people to assume the roles you create for them to do in a society, they will try to use their former experience in order to construct that role. So when they created local school councils and had these elections and elected all of these people to these local school councils for these 506 schools, they did not provide them with any training. They did not provide them with any education. So the people did what anyone would do. They constructed their role according to the only model they knew, which was the Democratic Party patronage model. All right. And that's what they do. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, in Chicago, nobody cares whether our children learn to read. Nobody. This is enough to break your heart. You walk into these schools, ladies and gentlemen, and you see our children in there wanting to learn, anxious to learn, with teachers who don't give a damn, who don't even try, who give excuses and excuses and excuses, and who still get their paychecks, still get promoted, and the teachers who are trying, let's don't leave them out. The teachers in there who are trying get discouraged. That's right. They get discouraged. How would you feel if you knocked yourself out with 30 little kids for 180 days and when you finished with them, they had grown three and four years in reading and then you sent them to a sucker who didn't do anything for the year and when you saw them again, they had lost everything that you taught them? How would you feel? You can't do this to these teachers. We can't do this to these teachers. We can't do this to these teachers. We've got to make these schools places that work for our children. That's right. And that's our responsibility, ladies and gentlemen. That's our responsibility. We cannot send our children to these schools. I don't care whether they're public, private, or parochial, and abandon your children in there and expect people to do what you should be doing for them. It's not going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. And if you think it is, you still don't get it. You just don't get it. You just don't get it. At face value, at face value, as I said, the abandonment of the test looks like a good deal for African Americans until you view it in the setting of this whole society. And then when you look at it that way, it takes on another face. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot make it in this society if you cannot read. Well, say it again. It is. It is. No. Our children are coming out of the high school and they can't read. They can't read. And our children are normal, ladies and gentlemen. Our children are normal. But we allow people to say they're not. Every time you sign a blue sheet sending a black kid to educably mentally handicapped, you're saying this is not a normal child. Listen, God did not create that many dumb black people. God didn't do that. You're doing it. These children just need to be taught. They need to be taught. They need to be taught. In 1932, Carter G. Woodson told us if a child doesn't learn, a child needs to be studied, not abandoned, not penalized, not put away, not labeled, studied, so that you could teach him or her. We're not doing that. We don't even expect teachers to do it. We don't even expect them to do it. We expect them to stand up in TV. I saw them just yesterday on TV saying, oh, my kids are crack babies. And well, that's 1%. What about all those that are not crack babies that can't read? Uh, my uh, parents don't come to school. No, they work in three jobs. Uh, my parents don't do this and whatever. All these excuses, all these excuses, ladies and gentlemen, that you and I know are not true. Raise your hand if you were born with money. Y'all had, you had all the money you needed. Raise your hand, I, I want to see them. <laughs> you could learn to read, and you were poor. How many of you had only one parent? 
grew up with only one parent. Can, how many of y'all can read? Uh, yeah, well, okay. Then why do you let teachers get away with this? Why do you do this? Why do you let them stand up on TV and let them say this and then give them a raise? You got, hey, ladies and gentlemen, still don't get it. Just don't get it. What has happened to our group pride, our group culture, our group advancement, group charity? We don't even want to take care of each other. We don't even want to, I, I go around to middle class people like me and say, let's raise the money, get some place for these people to live that's homeless. I got to pay for my bills. I got a $500 note on my car. Yeah, okay. Who cares anymore about the students? Nobody. Our children. Who is responsible for seeing that they survive? We have proceeded with political strategies as though politics can be considered separately from economic strategies. This won't work. It won't work. We've got to stop spending all our money as consumers, and we've got to learn to be producers and owners. That's right. Listen, our children do not need two weeks of sharing in kindergarten. They need two weeks of ownership. They need to learn what it means to own something. You need in every school that you find African Americans to have them open a bank account. Every single kid in the school, open a bank account. Learn how to save money so that they can pool their money and have a business. That's the way you make it here. We have no way to sanction leaders who don't lead, teachers who don't teach, principals who don't principal, preachers who don't advance the group, politicians who don't represent our interests, businessmen who don't help the group, athletes and entertainers who sell out. We, we don't have any way to sanction these folks. That's right. That's right. We let, I was standing in the record, uh, no, they don't call them records anymore. Uh, we call those things, Georgie. We call them little round things. Uh, CDs. I was in there, and a little girl was buying a CD by this foul group that, do, that denigrates women. So I went up to her and I said, why are you buying that? And so she looked at me and she said, you got a problem, what's up? And I said, I said, look, do you know how he talks about you in that, in that record, on a record? And she said, no, I don't listen to the words, I just like the music. So I said, look, this man talks about you like you a living dog. I said, and you, and then now and that he calls you by the dog's name, bitch. I said, you gonna pay money to take that home and participate in your own denigration? So she looked at me and she said, I don't listen to the words. I said, listen to them. I said, you listen to them because what you're doing is contributing to your own destruction. Right. Right? Yeah. We know these people. Right. You and I know who these people are, but we go support them with our dollars, go see them, give them money. The best way you can bring these entertainers down if you don't like them is don't spend your money with them. We worship consumerism. Oh my God, brothers and sisters, we worship consumerism and materialism. And as though selfishness is a virtue, just like Ayn Rand teaches. In fact, I have lived long enough to see a new Rand disciple who is black and female. Oh God, have mercy. The struggle for equality will not occur without a group effort, ladies and gentlemen. Individualism is not the way other groups advance in this society. Wealth is accumulated by one, but passed on by the group, by the family, by the business, by the institution, by the organization. The Kennedy fortune, the Rockefeller empires, those were begun by one person, but passed on and increased by the group effort. That's right. That is the nature of the company, That's right. the heart and engine of capitalism. The Millionaires Club formed in the African American community largely by entertainers and athletes passes on what and to whom. Except for a few of them, like Bill Cosby, it seems to be too little and too late. It is more important to us to buy a $40,000 car than to give $10,000 to Philander Smith College or Tougaloo. Right. We just don't get it, ladies and gentlemen. Black people just don't get it. 
There are not enough people like Ruth Hare in Philadelphia who accumulated wealth which she invested to pay the college tuitions and fees for a group of sixth graders if and when they graduated from high school. One Benz would pay four years of college for somebody. All right. Okay. Raise your hand if you think Bill Clinton is going to be the father to our children. Raise your hand if you think the Democrats are going to take care of our elderly. All right. I know you don't think the Republicans are going to do anything for us. All right. If it is to happen, we have to do it. If not, if not, ladies and gentlemen, we will not survive. All right. We will not survive. All right. You remember things fall apart? And the white man put a knife to our people and things fell apart. That will surely happen to us if we don't get it. All right. All right now. In our 1979 dissertation, Carol and Elaine Bennett Murray wrote the following. When teachers made causal attributions about the importance of their own characteristics in determining a successful performance for a student, they tended to perceive themselves as more responsible for a successful outcome for students belonging to a subordinate group, blacks, lower class, those failing in school, than to a superordinate group. If the superordinate kids failed, it was the teacher's fault. But if the black kids failed, it was their fault. Okay. However, counter to prediction, teachers perceive themselves as more responsible for a successful performance by black middle class students than black lower class students. But not so with whites. White middle class students were responsible for their success, but black middle class children's success was due to their teacher. And a reverse pattern of responding resulted when black middle class and lower class students failed. Teachers preferred, ladies and gentlemen, to teach black lower class students over black middle class students. The major implication of Bennett Murray's findings is to the extent that positive sentiments manifest themselves in rewards, a minority student will often be rewarded for failure and punished for success. Hence, the differential level of scholastic achievement observed among students of various socioeconomic and racial backgrounds may have less to do with tangibles, such as books, buildings, equipment, and so forth, than to do with intangibles, such as the differential expectations, the causal attributions, and sentiments expressed by the teacher for the student. Here we find that teachers tend to like, that is, express positive sentiment toward students whose characteristics live up to their expectations. Hence, since smart African American students do not live up to the teacher's low expectations for African American students, they do not like them. So the African American student in schools is damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. Now tell me, who wants to stay in school under these conditions? Yet, many African American teachers, many African American teachers behave in the same way, disregarding their tradition of pride, honor, intelligence, and struggle I do not know what has happened to us, ladies and gentlemen, over the 40 years that I've been in education. How did we arrive in this place? The white man has put the knife to what binds us together, and now things fall apart. After all of this history, struggle, the great men and women, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Martin Delaney, Sojourner Truth, W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells Barnett, Booker T. Washington, Mary Church Terrell, Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, 
Malcolm X, and Betty Shabazz, Leonard Jeffries, Shashi McIntyre, Donald Smith, and Alton Maddox. We still don't get it. Thank you. Dr. Barbara Sizemore. Dr. Barbara Sizemore. So those of you who may be slightly anticipating and anxious to hear whatever the topic is, discourse, is it? Racial discourse? That will come with Doc problem and problematic or whatever. That will come when Dr. Karenga comes. Can we have a warm greeting from my beloved sister, and boss. Thank you very much, Shashi. Um, my presentation this evening is dedicated to Dr. Charlotte Shashi Lawrence McIntyre. Uh, Shashi has been trying to Hold AHSA together. If you can't hear me, raise your hand. Shashi has been trying to hold AHSA together for quite some years now, and those of us in AHSA are very grateful to her for her work and her commitment. The topic of this President's Forum is the poverty of race transcendent discourse, the paradigm and problematic. Dr. Karingo will talk to you about that. I am not. I want to talk to you about the education of our children in public schools. And I want to talk to you to use as my case specific Chicago. Now I know that many of you do not come from Chicago and probably are not aware of what is going on in Chicago. So I'm going to first give you just a little brief uh, history of it. Won't be long. And then I want to talk to you about what's going on. Um, Chicago has been trying to take back the schools from the African-American majority. 60% of the students in the Chicago public schools are African-American, 30% are Hispanic, and 10% are white. Um, Chicago, the Chicago uh, majority has been trying to take the schools back from the African-American majority, and I want that to be a contradiction in your mind. That's why I'm saying it that way. And it's been three phases to it. Phase one was to get rid of Ruth Love and anybody else who was interested in educating our children. Now, I mean by that teaching them how to read, write, and do mathematics. The second phase was to take the governance of the system and put it in the hands of the people so that adults' needs would be taken care of and whether or not they met the needs of the children was secondary and still is. The third phase, and in that phase, in that phase, this whole restructuring did three very important things. It eliminated positions, and when you eliminate the position, you eliminate the person in the position and took away the whole African-American middle management of the school system and gave it to other groups. But they left the top people, the superintendent and the deputy superintendent and the assistant superintendents and the chief financial officer, African-American, which gives you the illusion that you're still handling it. Once these positions were eliminated, the people in them had to go or be demoted. And so a whole group of African Americans with a lot of experience, 
about how you educate African American children. People committed to that left the school system. Phase three is about to commence, and that is the privatization of public schooling. And Ben o. Schmidt was here last week, my friends, my brothers and sisters, talking to us about Edison Corporation which intends to take over the public schools and run them for profit. Now, brothers and sisters, if you just know this much about capitalism, you know that when your goal is to make a profit, everything else is secondary. <laughs> which means that the education of our children will be secondary to making money. Now, there are a lot of brothers and sisters that say, well, maybe we ought to go for this and take over these schools and run them ourselves. Well, yeah, maybe we ought to do that. We ought to do that. But do we have enough money to fight Whittle? Do we have enough capital to run most of these schools where our children are? Or will we just take two or three of them and then 404 of them will go to Xerox, IBM, Paramount Pictures. We need to think about this. And we need to plan for it. Because if we are going to go for privatization, sisters and brothers, we need to start saving some capital, quit building churches and build schools, <laughs> put our money where our mouth is, and do it. But if we're just going to sit around and talk about it, let me tell you, Edison's going to grab it and go. They need to think about this. The privatization of public schools raises several questions around the protection of access, participation, and successful outcomes in the education for minorities. Now, the book that all the white people are reading about this, brothers and sisters, is a book called Public Education and Autopsy by Myron Lieberman. And this is what he says in that book. He says that civil rights referred to civil capacity to contract, to own property, to make wills, to give evidence, and to sue and be sued. Now this is big news to me, because I always thought that civil was derived from civ civis feminine, which is a Latin word meaning citizen and that citizen rights were embodied in the Bill of Rights, that's one through 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution, one through 10, and Amendment 14. And any of you know who that much about the African-American struggle for education in this country knows that our entire struggle has been around the 14th Amendment. Now, uh, Amendment 14 says, one, a citizen is anyone who is born in the United States or naturalized therein. No state shall abridge citizenship rights without due process. And every citizen should have equal protection of the law. Now, if these are not citizen rights or civil rights, then I just don't know what I'm talking about. Furthermore, this man says in this book, listen to this, <clears throat> as used here, the term civil rights does not include any financial entitlements, brothers and sisters, or protection against all private expressions of prejudice. It does, however, include the right not to be subject to discrimination by government. Do you understand what I said? Yeah. I said that a private school can discriminate against you if they want to, after all, it's private. Do you get the message? Yeah. Thank you. So since private schools would be entitled to private expressions of prejudice, where does this leave groups which are discriminated against, like you know who? This is what this man also says in his book. Now this is the book that the people are reading who go on for privatization. They sent me a copy. Lieberman says that private schools have the right to exclude students they do not want, while public schools enjoy free tuition. So it's a quid pro quo. He argues that public schools have the advantage, because people can go to them free. He is willing, however, 
to take this advantage away from the public schools, but unwilling to disturb the private school's advantage. In other words, we're going to have private schools, and they're going to charge, or we're going to give vouchers so everybody has to pay the school, right? So the free tuition is gone because everybody will be paid. But private schools can still exclude. Something's wrong with that, brothers and sisters. Now, in this new system of three-tiered schools, that's those that are running for profit, those that are running for not-for-profit, like parochial schools and Catholic schools, and the public schools, what advantage would the public schools enjoy to offset the unfair advantage then held by private schools? And it would be different, brothers and sisters, if we were all together on this. But can't you see these middle-class Negroes in their Cadillacs driving off to these private schools trying to get in there and run away from the rest of y'all? We're not even together on it. We're not even together on it. I got brothers and sisters in schools that are prejudiced against their children, paying big bucks for them to go there every day. And if I give you their names, you know them. Lieberman states. Lieberman states. The following, this is what he says about bilingual education. He says, fundamentally, bilingual education is based on ethnic politics. Hispanic political leaders view bilingual education as a source of patronage and jobs for their constituents. Lip service is paid to integration and proficiency in English. Failure to achieve these objectives is allegedly due to failure to fund bilingual education adequately. In economic terms, bilingual education is a prime example of the subordination of consumer to producer interests. Now, if that's what they got to say about bilingual education, where these kids speak Spanish, what do you think they're going to say about Afrocentric education? Now, this comment comes from one who advocates the privatization of education for minority children. So their civil rights can be abrogated. Moreover, no notion of the advantages of knowing two languages exists here. In almost all the other industrial nations of the world, it's good to know more than one, one language, but not here. Other recommendations made by this man to make a profit are these. Let students leave school at 14. How do you like that? Private schools should not be required to accept all children. Ethnic disparities should not be considered prima facie evidence that discrimination exists. Private schools can discriminate legally. Groups that wish to transmit their own heritage should be required to pay for it. Now. Are you listening? Yeah. <laughs> more disturbing, more disturbing is his willingness to accept the thesis that African Americans are genetically inferior as valid. And that's the reason he states that schools ought to be able to exclude. Find this on page 356 of this book, especially when some of your friends send it to you to read to elicit your support as a middle-class Negro for a private school. On page 210, he says, Personally, I do not agree that public policies that have a disparate impact on blacks are necessarily racist. When does one know when they are? <laughs> what are the criteria for determination? What difference does it make if private schools are exempt and able to discriminate on this basis anyway? The Supreme Court, in its decision in Plessy versus Ferguson, deciding that segregation, if equal, only connotated the inferiority of the Negro in the mind of the Negro, reveals the fallacy behind these ideas. This man notes that multicultural education, race problems, educating the minorities, have destroyed public education. He boldly says in a whole chapter that the reason we in the mess today is because of y'all. You raised such a ruckus about equity. You raised so much cane about being segregated. You fussed and stormed so much about being educated. You made the white people angry with the public schools. And so now it's your fault that they disappeared. This man 
advises all of these white people to whom he serves as a high price consultant. He advises them to abolish school boards or have them appointed by mayors. Would you like Dickie do that for you? <laughs> Down with democratic elections. Put people in jail if they cheat on tests. Now listen, <laughs> the supply, oh hey, you all better wake up. Because this is what is store for you. This is what this reform was getting to with your cooperation. With your cooperation. The supply and demand paradigm of capitalism will be working in the market plan of private for profit schools. The better the schools, the scarcer and more expensive they will become, putting them out of the reach of the working poor. And this will create a system of premier schools and pauper schools, relegating once again our people to an inferior universe of education, just as it was done in the first Jim Crow. Our brothers and sisters, can't you see this cycle coming around again? We went through the first Reconstruction and the first Jim Crow, then the second Reconstruction. This is the second Jim Crow. Wake up! The things that are happening to us now have happened once before. We're going through this again, where we are being the first reconstruction of big promises of the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment were given to us, and we created the public school system in the South according to Du Bois and Black Reconstruction, the founding of the public schools, and our people rushed into the schools to get educated, to read, write, and do mathematics, and then what happened? They cut them off. And we went into Jim Crow and separation, separate but equal, and they were never equal. That's what's happening to us now. That's what's going to happen through this, unless we intervene and do something different. Now, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I've been talking about this before you for so long. I hate to come back with it again. I find myself with one note, Pollyanna, talking about this over and over. New audiences, to be sure, same message. All children can learn, but this pervasive belief that somehow poverty prevents you from learning is just something I cannot understand. I cannot understand it. I cannot understand it. How African-American people who poor as they can be can believe that poverty keeps you from reading. How many of you were poor when you were little? <laughs> okay, same people who raised your hand, same people. How many of you can read? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you see Oprah the other morning? Did you see her? Well, these African-American teachers were up there talking about these kids like they were some kind of dogs, inhuman animals that you have to cuss at and beat in order to get them to understand what's going to happen. Everybody jumped on the mother who was defending her kid. I mean, you know, like, it was really crazy. It was really crazy. Walk around and talk to people and find out how they feel about our children in school. They don't talk about them like they're people. They don't talk about them like they're students. They don't talk about them like they can learn, like they're not normal people who deserve love and care and affection and a good teacher. Let me tell you that a child whose mother is a junkie, let me tell you, Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, a child whose mother is a junkie and whose father is in prison has as much right to learn how to read as my child does. I have spent the last 15 years of my life studying high-achieving, predominantly African-American schools. My research is clear that proper teaching in a way which helps children to overcome the exigencies of poverty, crime, violence, disrupted families, and disorganized communities produces high achievement. For 10 years now, at these conferences, I have given you the evidence, the addresses and telephone numbers of these schools. I even brought a video, Ace of Hilliard and I served uh, as co-chairpersons to AIT, and we now have videos of these schools that we can show you. These schools got principals in them. They have addresses and telephone numbers. 
You folks who live in Chicago could jump on the bus and go to Pittsburgh. Those of you who live in Atlanta and the South can go to Dallas. These schools are real. And in these schools, our children are learning. Not at some little old penny ante level, like people say, oh, they grew two months in 30 months. No, no. The Van Elementary School in the Pittsburgh public school system is 98% black. The children live in Bedford Housing Authority, which is the largest public housing in Pittsburgh. Only 19% of these children live with their mother and father. It is a high crime area, drug infested. It's in Ward 5, District 1, the highest crime area in Pittsburgh. And this school was the highest achieving of the 51 elementary schools in the Pittsburgh public school system in 1990 in mathematics. 90% of these children scored at or above the national norm on the California Achievement Test in mathematics. Since that time, Madison School, down the road and around the corner, where the children come from the second largest public housing in Pittsburgh, was the highest achieving in reading and mathematics for two years in a row. Now, there are 51 elementary schools in the Pittsburgh public school system, brothers and sisters, and they still have five all-white schools. So don't sell that stuff to me. I don't want to hear it. This is the problem. The problem is getting our people. Let's don't worry about white people right now. All right. Getting our people to believe that our children can learn. Getting our people to believe that they should learn. That's the first thing. And then getting them to do it. And that's the next thing. The Chicago Reform Law of 1988, the reform is to take the school system back to the white majority. That's what, that's what it's supposed to do. And it's for who? Adults who need jobs, because IBM and Xerox are firing them, and they have to have some place to go. That's what all these new laws about, no, you don't have to be certified now. Uh, uh, Governor Edgar has one coming up. Uh, new Jersey has one. Uh, that where now, you don't need to have a lot of uh, psychology courses or methodology courses or, or courses, gen ed. Uh, I mean, you could be a plumber, you know, a fired plumber from some place and come in and teach our kids, because of course anybody can teach our kids, right? Because they're stupid anyhow. Huh? Listen to that. It's very careful for you to listen to what's being talked about, because if you're going to have a position on it, we need to develop one. Presently, I am working with 12 schools on the implementation of the 10 routines, which have proved effective in the schools I have studied. Some of these schools are going to be successful. Others will not. Governance, no matter who does it, brothers and sisters, is not the answer alone. Innovation will not solve this problem alone. Neither will additional resources solve this problem alone. Small class size won't solve this problem or any other newfangled fad. What has to change, brothers and sisters, is what goes on in the classroom, what goes on between the teacher and the student over the medium. Let me just give you one little example, and you will understand this. In a high-achieving school, when the student doesn't get it, the first thing the teacher looks at is the medium. That's what he or she is teaching and what he or she is using to teach it. The question the teacher asks in the high-achieving school is, does it fit? Is it the kind of thing I should use? Am I doing the right thing? In a low-achieving school where our children are concentrated and can't read, the first thing the teacher looks at is the student. Get the psychiatrist. Get the assistant principal. Get him out of here. <laughs> Do something to him. There is a stark difference between these two schools. In a high-achieving schools, the teachers teach what the children need to know, not what's in the cotton picking book. These books weren't written by people who know your children. You cannot get a textbook. You can get this one. This is uh, Sharshi's book called Criminalizing the Race. <laughs> you cannot get a book and the book is going to tell you what to teach. You have to do an assessment of what your children know. 
And then what is it they need to know in order to be a successful student in that subject and prepare for the next level? That's what you have to teach. I find teachers in low achieving school, here it is, October the 15th, and they're still reviewing addition and subtraction. And everybody in the class can do it. That's a waste of their time. Work around. Watch how many teachers you see sitting on a seat. You can't teach school that way. Not to African American children. You got to walk and talk. You got to walk around. Show them how to do things. Communicate with them. Give immediate feedback. You can't sit on your can and grade papers and teach. That's not the way you do it. When you see a lot of writing going on in classes, that is not teaching, brothers and sisters. That's control. You control the kid when you got him writing. I went in a classroom, the kid had written um, the spelling words. He was working on spelling words. No, it was a girl. She was working on spelling words. And this is what happened. She had written her spelling word orphan, O-R-P-H-A-N. OK, she had written it about 10 times. So I said to her, I said, oh, that's nice, honey. I said, you sure can write good. I said, what does orphan mean? She said, we ain't got to that yet. <laughs> Now, any time you have somebody write a word 10 times, they don't even know what it is. That's not teaching, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -mm. That's what you call control. <laughs> so, uh, so beware. When you walk through these classrooms, see, first, look for the teachers. Teachers sitting on his or her can, got a problem. Secondly, the teachers always grading papers, got a problem. That means too much writing is going on in there, right? And not enough teaching. Teaching is not synonymous with writing or reading. Teaching is a whole different act where you communicate with another human being over a medium to find out do they understand a skill or a concept. And it's that you give to them, they give to you. In a teaching learning situation, the teacher is as much as a student as a student because you are constantly learning what it is about your student that you need to know so that you can communicate with your student better in order to do what? Learn the lesson. Too many, and you can teach ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, you can teach anybody anything that you know. Now you can't teach people what you don't know. <laughs> but you can teach anybody anything that you know, any age, any age, blind, cripple, or crazy. If you know it, you can teach it to anybody, anytime, any age. It's just another prerequisite you have to have. You have to know it. And you have to understand how your learner processes information and applies it to use. You have to know that. If you got those two things together, you can teach anybody anything. Ladies and gentlemen, I will be 67 years old, December the 17th, 1927. I started teaching when I was 19 years old in Chicago Public Schools. I have never, ever had a student I could not teach how to read. Never. Someone called me the other day and told me that Ira Murchison had died. I remember when Ira Murchison was in eighth grade at the John D. Shoup School at 1460 West 112th Street, and he couldn't read, and he was very disturbed about that. And he told me one day, he said, I'm going to be the world's greatest runner. He said, but there's one thing I don't know how to do. I can't read well. I said, do you want to learn how to read? He said, yes. He said, now I'm going to teach you. And he learned how to read. In one year, he learned how to read. It should not take us 180 days to teach anybody anything, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. You can teach a dumb dog a trick in 90 days. <laughs> a human being is a wonderful person. A human being has enormous intelligence. All human beings are gifted in this way. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether they're slow learners or moderate learners or fast learners. You can teach a person who's a slow learner to be a fast learner, just like you can speak, teach a slow reader to be a speed reader. There's no secret about it. All that you need is a teacher who knows it herself or himself and understands how the learner processes information. Teachers do not spend enough time doing either one of those things. We don't spend enough time. I am amazed at the number of my students at DePaul planning to be teachers who do not read. Rough, rough. You can't learn everything you need to know from television. 
I mean, they don't, they haven't put all the information you need on video yet. I mean, they're getting there, CD-ROMs are trying. But it's not there yet. If we want children to be readers, we have to be readers. At least teachers have to be readers. Those are some of the things that I'm noticing happening. I want to bring to your attention today, I spend almost all my time in schools. This is the first time in my life I have worked at an institution where I did not get penalized for helping the poor. And oddly enough, it's a Catholic urban white university. The whole time I was in the Chicago public schools, I had to fight to help poor people. I mean fight, and eventually had to leave my job because it was such a struggle. And I was determined I was not going to work for James Moffat, so I left. And Man for Bird wouldn't deliver me, so I had to go. But I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that we know everything that we need to know in order to teach the children that we have and love. One last note on Benno Schmidt. Does everybody know who Benno Schmidt is now? Okay, Benno Schmidt was the uh, president of Yale University, and he quit to be the president of the Edison Corporation. The Edison Corporation is owned by Whittle, which owns Communication One, where they're teaching your kids with the commercials on television. Y'all know this? Hey, you better wake up, brothers and sisters. You gotta know this. You have to know this. Because these are the people going to take over the public school. How many of you planning to teach or are teaching? You going to continue? Are you going to continue? All right, you, you got to understand what's happening. Okay, everybody know who Ben O'Schmidt is now? All right. He has hired Deborah McGriff, African-American, former superintendent of Detroit, as his right-hand girl, lady, woman, whatever. Help, assistance, whatever. And she is now at a six-figure six salary, I understand. And she is now recruiting African-Americans to be principals of these schools. You will not be fighting Benno. Are you hearing me? Thank you. This is what he said in his speech here last week. He says, teachers and principals must want to educate these children and committed to doing whatever is necessary to make this happen. He said, an innovative school would look like this. There would be more time, 210 days at 12 hours a day, Information technology would be pervasive. Every student and teacher would have a computer at school and at home. The curriculum would be clear, integrated, reinforced vertically and horizontally, enriched and interesting with lots of music and art, physical fitness, health and play, and more unstructured time. Now listen, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. If you have our children coming from disrupted families, disorganized communities, where their lives are unstructured most of the time, if you want to teach these children to be students, you have to structure the time in school so they can learn it. Now, if you are satisfied if you are satisfied, if you're satisfied with this, that's one thing. I, I'm clearly not, as you can tell. But if you're satisfied with reading these reports in the Chicago Tribune about all these schools that are predominantly African American, what can't nobody read, if that pleases you, then forget everything I say. If it's all right with you, if it's all right with you, because they're going to give you what you want. They're going to give you what you want in order to get your vote on this private school thing. If it's all right with you that they give you everything you ask for in an Afrocentric school, if that's okay with you, and the kids, 52% uh, of them are in the bottom quarter and can't read Africa, if that's okay with you, then fine. Don't pay attention to me. But remember, our children have to have both, not one or the other. No trade-offs. They have to have both, not one or the other, no trade-offs. So don't fall for that old okie-doke, because they're ready to do that. You see, because if you can't read, 
and you can't write, and you can't compute, you're not going to have a job in the 21st century. It's going to be to prison for you. And remember, prison building is the biggest, biggest growth industry, especially in Illinois. We got four on there going up. And remember, you can't even help yourself with a prison. They build it in the white rural section of Illinois where the jobs all go to the people living out there and where they get the construction jobs. So you didn't even get to build these things you put you in. No work in them. It's not a profit for us, needless to say, about our children. Let me end with a mention about equity because this is what this struggle has been about. We're getting equity confused with equality, ladies and gentlemen, and not the same thing. Look, we may not all need the same thing. We may not all need the same money spent on us. A kid whose mother is a junkie whose father's in prison may need more than my kid. Treating them equal would not be fair. That's what equity is all about. Equity is concerned with justice, with what is fair not equality. Equality is concerned with what is the same. Now, there are some things we want equality in. We certainly want the same dollars spent on our children as spent on anybody else. Equal dollars. We definitely want that. No more of this, this uh, unequal stuff, all right? We also want our children to achieve as well as any other group on a standardized achievement test because they can do it, ladies and gentlemen. You have been brainwashed into believing that our children cannot do this. Our children can do this. They just have to be taught what they need to know in order to do it. All of you passed tests. You had to. You couldn't be here if you didn't. You have to, there are prerequisites to doing it, and that's what our children have to know. So let's don't get equity confused with equality, because if you don't know what they're talking about, you will get tricked. And the trade-offs you will agree to will come back and haunt you. Remember, if it's not fair, don't buy it. That's why Lonnie Guineer was shut up. Because she was talking about what is fair, not what is equal, what is fair. And the very thing that Lonnie Guineer was talking about for us these white people are going to be selling you in South Africa. You have to be careful about what you agree to. You have to understand what the whole game about is about. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, what is up for grabs now is public schooling. That's what's up for grabs, public schooling. White America is giving up on democracy. Oh, yeah. It's giving up. That's what Lonnie is talking about. Read her book, The Tyranny of the Majority. That's what Lonnie Guineer is telling you. White America is giving up on democracy because there's too many of y'all wanting it. And so since, since whiteness is property, as Cheryl Harris said in the Harvard Law Review, June 1993, since whiteness is property, it confers undeserved benefits and privileges just from being born, which you nor I can't take back unless we change the rules. Now, we may not have the votes to change the rules, but brothers and sisters, we do have the power. Brother Adams, we could have let you continue. However, we have two other speakers. I'm sure everyone would like to hear also. Um, you really are a balanced scientist. Wow. Intellectual, spiritual, philosophical, and he has provided us with the holistic framework in order to look at learning and how we can begin to dialogue and criti critique that learning. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, of course, requires no introduction. 
I'm only going to present her to you. Dr. Barbara Sizemore, uh, who has served as my mentor, she helped us as a consultant for a curriculum guide we'll be developing from Afrocentric perspective in New Jersey. She has taken up the challenge that was presented to us last night by some of the speakers, which who spoke not only of the need to develop an Afrocentric curriculum in schools, but how do you begin to have an impact on the political processes to make sure those curricula are adopted and accepted in the school system? Um, I'm going to let you talk about the struggles you've had with that particular uh, phase of your life or experience. Dr. Sizemore is going to speak to us about the debate on African-centered curriculum. Dr. Sizemore. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Sister Sharshi is now 1055. I want to talk with you the, uh, about the debate over uh, the African-centered curriculum. So uh, my brother Wade Nobles will talk to you about the African-centered curriculum. I want to talk to you about the politics around this because generally in this struggle that we're having to educate our children in this country, uh, most of the struggles are in a political context. And it's this context that batters uh, most African Americans and sometimes we are unable to know what to do in this struggle because well, the knowledge or information is just not at our fingertips about this matter. Now, there are many changes recommended for reforming education. And this, this big reform of education, as you know, had a critical year in 1983 when Ronald Reagan was our president. And uh, in the script they prepared for him to, to act, he, he, um, <laughs> he, um, he settled on a program that was to advance the interests of middle-income white Americans. And these reform efforts that have been suggested to us for our pursuit are uh, options that will advance uh, the cause of middle income uh, whites and any blacks who've happened to jump on those bandwagons. Unfortunately, unfortunately, our people are sometimes uh, not informed enough to know which of these options are, are, uh, are to their, uh, not to their interest. Uh, so let's talk about some of them. Largely, uh, th these uh, reforms are a result of the failure of schools to elevate and accelerate the achievement of American youth, but not African Americans. That's what Ronald Reagan had in mind. It was the European Americans he was concerned about who continued to rank about 17th or 18th in international performance competition, especially in math and science. Now, African American children are not getting good education either, of course, and their chronic low achievement is testimony to that fact. And first, in the fight against segregation, racism was never defined as the cause and segregation the symptom. That was the first problem. Now, Malefi Asante says a strategy is a long-term plan for achieving an objective, while tactics is the science of arranging and managing the details of human behavior. And the long-term plan for African-American advancement is to eliminate racism. That's the belief in the superiority of one race over another. And busing, magnet schools, and other reforms were merely tactics that were supposed to get us to this point. For African Americans in public education, the long-term strategy then is eliminating racism from the curriculum and the attendant achievement gap between white and black students. Asante warns us, however, that tactics which become the objective lead to self-deception. And so for many of us, you see, these desegregation tactics have become the end, and we've forgotten all about the elimination of racism, which still exists in the curriculum we teach every day. In this study, in their study of 200 high schools and 400 elementary schools for desegregation effects, Crane, uh, Mayhard, and Narrett in 1982 investigated two aspects of academic success, among others. And this uh, study has kind of like been buried uh, in the studies. Um, these are the two things that they looked at, achievement and self-esteem. And they found that students felt reasonably good about their academic abilities and that African-American students were as confident as European-Americans despite their generally lower test scores. In other words, the generally lower test scores really didn't affect the way that African-American students felt about themselves contrary to what some people are writing about, like in the rumors of superior, inferiority. But at any rate, two-thirds of both races said that they had the ability to complete college. The students resist labeling themselves as poor students and they don't like being called at risk either. 35% of European Americans, 
35% of European Americans and 21% of African Americans said that they were above average, and only 5 and 9% respectively said they were below. This is a 1982 study, and I really don't think that African American students have internal, the majority, and maybe some of them have, because all is never absolute, but I don't believe that the majority of African American students believe that the test scores are really an indication of their achievement or ability. The central finding of this study was that the racial climate of the desegregated school was central to the African Americans' feelings about the school, not themselves, yeah. Yeah. about the school. And for African American males, their feelings about the school were critical to their ability to do school work well. Yeah. Yeah. For European Americans, school race relations were secondary. For African Americans, they were not. The other important finding for the researchers was the negative relationship between high interracial contact and racial tensions. Racial tensions rose where interracial contact was highest. And that stands to reason, I mean, that's just a common sense thing. The more white people you got with black people, the more tensions you're gonna have. Fewer white people, less tensions, that's just a fact. Significantly, they also found that African-American students in predominantly African-American high schools had higher academic self-esteem than others, which is what Jacqueline Fleming found out in her study of black college students. Even the European-Americans in predominantly African-American schools had higher self-esteem. <laughs> you see why this report got lost? Researchers suspect that African-American schools often make a special effort to provide a good school experience for their European-American student minorities, and that this explains the higher test scores of European-Americans in predominantly African-American schools. But the high Euro European-American withdrawal from these schools makes it hazardous. So even though these white kids learn better in the black schools, they still leave, because they're just racist. You see, um, and that's something we, that's very real that we have to deal with. Desegregation is not going to cure racism. <coughs> we have to do something else. We have to do something else with these people besides mix up with them. In any of these schools, in any of these schools where achievement is high for African American students, the principle is the key factor and can cause a change in behavior before attitude change occurs. So you don't have to change people's attitudes to get them to teach African American children, right? You just change the structure. For one thing, if they'd get fired if they didn't do it, that'd be a help. <laughs> While the investigators argue that school behavior can be changed, Without challenging belief systems, another approach is to hire more African American and liberal teachers to change teacher behavior. And I'm glad they had liberal in there because we've got an increasingly larger number of conservative African Americans who are enough to make you vomit. <laughs> Importantly, the investigators also found that human relations workshops, courses, and materials useful in promoting behavioral change and also minority history were useful, but not as a course. Right. They recommended the integration of minority history into the regular curriculum. This was 1982, folks, and these people who did this study were white. You see why I got lost? Michael J. Barrett in the November 1990 Atlantic Monthly makes the case for more schools to improve American student achievement. In a comparison with 12th grade, 12th grade students internationally, the United States ranked 12th among 15 nations with Hong Kong, Japan, Finland, England, Sweden, Israel, New Zealand, Flemish, Belgium, Ontario, Scotland, British Columbia, and Hungary ahead of the United States in advanced algebra functions, calculus, and geometry. Observers have noted that Americans place more emphasis on differences in innate ability, while others place more emphasis on effort. According to Barrett, if aptitude rather than effort is seen as the key to achievement, the result will be to undermine the work ethic, at least as it applies to education. What's more, Barrett notes that American parents are contented or satisfied with their students' education even though they are failing in comparison with youngsters internationally. Yeah. Strangely enough, African American parents rate the schools higher than white parents and the schools treat us worse, all right? Now, Barrett believes 
that it is impossible for Americans to achieve at a high standard as long as we attend schools 180 days, which is low in comparison to 24 other nations, Japan, West Germany, South Korea, Israel, Nigeria, and Swaziland. Now, African-American parents are the ones in the Gallup poll of 1983 who said that they wanted the school year to be longer and the school day to be longer. It's the white parents who don't. The next reform that has been shoved down our throats and unfortunately championed by some of us is choice. Choice is now the lead idea for improving education, especially thanks to Polly. The idea is for the state to provide vouchers to parents in order to send their children to any school of choice. Milwaukee is now experimenting with this, this solution, which was championed by Polly Williams, their state representative. Vouchers of $2,500 each were offered to children to attend the schools of their choice. Also, a school has been designated for all African-American males, like they got some kind of problem that's untreatable except when they're together. Choice advocates believe in the infallibility of the free market. They think that competition will provide the incentives for improving the quality of education. In reality, what's going to happen is the development of premier schools where the children of the rich and affluent will go and pariah schools where the children of the poor will go. The latter will contain concentrations of minority students because the free market works according to supply and demand. And as a demand for schools with high SAT and CAT scores soar, and the demand for these schools increases, their tuition will rise completely out of the reach of poor parents who have no money to augment the voucher given by the state. Furthermore, schools will be more segregated than ever before as the premier schools evolve into predominantly European American domains. More important yet, there will be no initiatives to change this since these were the choices of the parents. Yeah. Right. Then there are the reforms of parental control. Parental control, that's just an interesting phenomenon. Uh, we don't seem to have learned anything from Ocean Hill, Bronzeville, IS-201 in New York, Anacostia, Adams Morgan, and the decentralization of the D.C. public schools in Washington, D.C., and the Woodlawn Experimental Schools project in Chicago itself. We don't seem to have learned one cotton-picking thing. 500 or more parent councils have been established in Chicago by electing participants to serve on each of these councils to provide the leadership and policy making for each school. The parent councils hire and fire the principal who has no tenure, and that's about all they can do. Why? Because 85% of the school's budget is in personnel. They do not have control over that budget because you have to pay people to work. So it's only 15% of the budget they can do anything with. You know, that's the money you spend for paper and books and paper clips and stuff like that. Now, the only thing they can do is hire the principal and fire the principal because he or she has no tenure, or they can take a teacher's position and make two janitor jobs out of it, or two janitor jobs and make a teacher out of it, you know what I'm saying, rob Peter to pay Paul. That's the best they can do with that. Since there is not enough money to train these people for these parent councils, for any kind of policy making, what do you think is going to happen in a city like Chicago? They're going to use the only model that they know anything about, which is what? The patronage model of the Democratic Party. And that's exactly how these parents are going. Didn't it happen in New York? Didn't it happen in Anacostia? Didn't it happen in DC? I mean, what in the heck do you think is going to happen? If you don't train people to know any different, they're going to do what they do. If I ask you to do something, and I don't teach you how to do it, what you're going to bring to that task is what you already know. And then you're going to say, let me see if I can make this sucker work. And if it doesn't work, then you keep trying to make what you know work until somebody comes along and says, look, fool, that ain't going to work. You got to do this. And then you say, uh-oh, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Peterson says that in the past, decentralized ward-based patronage-focused lay controlled school boards were gradually replaced by centralized, citywide, professionally directed, reform-oriented boards because of the corruption which followed. Teachers have retained their tenure rights in the Chicago public schools. 
Therefore, they will continue to have lifetime rights to their jobs, even though the principal is expected to elevate achievement. Now, you tell me how you can make people under your supervision do something if you don't have the right to fire them when they don't. That's impossible. Let me give you an example. At the Jensen Academy, this is a Chicago school, K-8 school in Chicago, 99.7% of African Americans in this school. The improvement plan adopted last year calls for expanding the whole language approach to the upper grades, emphasizing critical thinking skills, and integrating African American history into all of the areas of the curriculum. Now, this is great, but there's one thing wrong with this plan. You cannot teach children in Chicago who speak black English with whole language. Now, they're going to do this whole language approach to the upper grades, all right? Two out of every three Africans in Chicago come from Mississippi. Have you ever heard a really severe Mississippi dialect? Take your hand off the cup of Bible and eat it rock. <laughs> How are you going to whole language somebody out of that? Look. If you want to teach somebody with the black dialect to speak standard English, you must teach them the sounds. They don't have them. They can't give them to you. They don't have them. Look, a black English dialect has double the number of short vowel sounds that you need to speak standard English. That's why so many of us say, ask me a question. I'll be on Janjara first. All right? Now, if you want to correct that, you have to teach the standard English sounds. Otherwise, be grateful for asking me a question. And don't worry the person. Right? Now, a whole language says that you do not teach phonics separate from the whole language approach. In other words, one principal told me, oh, they'll learn it through osmosis. Can you believe that? When's the last time you learned something through osmosis? Well, it just goes to show you What's going to happen in these schools? That's just one example. While concentrating on the integration of African American history, African American language is ignored. You see, you've got to do the whole thing. You've got to look at what did, what did, what did the, uh, Carter G. Woodson tell us in this education of the Negro? He said, the scientific study of the Negro himself, his life, his history, his culture. That's what has to happen if you're going to teach our children in these schools. And I don't care whether it's public, private, or parochial. It has to be done. Many critics warn us in the ivory tower about being carried away by the elegance and exquisiteness of ideas and experiments. But many of our parents in these schools don't know that the people in the universities don't know what the hell they're talking about. They believe that these people really honestly know how to teach their children. And I thought, how can this person know how to teach your child when he or she hasn't the slightest idea about what African life history and culture is about? You can't even begin to analyze the problems that the children bring to you as a teacher if you don't understand who they are in the first place. Next comes collegiality. And this comes from Roland Barth of Harvard. And then there's teacher decision making and power from Linda Darling Hammond of Rand. And a host of other ideas. And don't get me wrong, it's not just European Americans who are trying to sell these, but they've got their black counterparts, African American counterparts, who are also coming across their doorstep with their bookcases and satchels in their hands selling this junk. Barth notes that collegiality is the presence of our specific behaviors. And in his book, Improving Schools from Within, he says, adults in schools talk about practice. Adults engage together and work on curriculum planning, designing, researching, and evaluating curriculum. And adults in schools teach each other what they know about teaching, learning, and leading. And he talks about these aspects in great detail in his book. But very little emphasis is placed on accountability or teacher administration evaluation. In fact, it is demeaned in Barth's book. Moreover, Barth bashes tests regarding them as unimportant to real education, even though Harvard relies heavily on SAT scores for admission. Now, in most schools, even athletes must score 700 on the SAT, as though the SAT has anything to do with playing football. So far, some educators 
to pond some so far some educators to ponder theoretically over their educational so far I'm sorry so far some educators to ponder theoretically over their educational worth is moot and this is why I tell you that I spent the first 30 years of my teaching life fighting tests and when I finally got to be superintendent in what I thought was an all black city I abolished tests and they abolished me so <laughs> It's very clear to me that tests will remain here. Tests will remain here. So the best thing for us to do is to find out how you pass these suckers and do it, just like the Asian Americans do. And those are the schools that I study. I study schools where African American students exceed white students on tests, and these are public schools. Now, while teacher participation in decision making is important, most teachers do not want to be involved in all of the decisions necessary for running a high achieving school. They want to be involved only in those decisions which will affect their classrooms, all right, and the teachers themselves. They don't want to order toilet paper, paper clips, get the roof fixed and all that kind of stuff. They just want to be concerned with what impacts on teaching children, like what kind of books to use, how do you place children in groups for teachers to teach, and so forth and so on, what kind of staff development and things like that. So what we have to look at is what do teachers need to do in schools to teach children, all children. Actually, educators resist doing what has proven to be effective in accelerating the achievement of African American students. Now, it's not just educators who do this, though. African American parents are often their own worst enemies. I go into meetings a lot of times, all equipped with this information to fire at the school board and at the superintendent. And African American parents will jump up and defend these suckers and say, oh, the parents ain't doing what they're supposed to do in their homes. And I want to say, oh, sit down, shut up. I love the idea. What is important? Maybe parents aren't doing what they're supposed to do at home, but that's got nothing to do with teaching somebody to read in a group of 22 in a classroom where you get paid $68,000 to do it. I'm saying to you. What we need to keep in mind is that whoever is in the class before the students is responsible for teaching something? Jesus Christ. Is it a giveaway program where all you got to do is go in there and sit down and keep people quiet and get your $65,000 every year? I mean, what's going on? What needs to be reconsidered here is accountability. Principals and teachers need to be accountable for something that goes on in the classroom. And let me suggest that it's teaching children how to read, write, and do arithmetic. What do we need to talk about then with these people in order to make racists teach our children in school? One thing we have to talk about, my friends, is what do they do in schools where African-American children who are poor come from single female-headed families, live in high crime areas, and still excel? What do they do in those schools? One thing they do is they make the proper assessment of what these children need to know. And you cannot do this, my friends, if you do not understand the cultural experiences that the children bring to the teaching learning situation. It will never happen. So. Multicultural education is another reform arena more closely related to my work. The idea here is to bring the curriculum into touch with the real world of cultural diversity which characterizes the United States and our public schools. It's an interesting domain. According to Sims report in the education special report of the New York Times, this reform effort is obstructed by a growing dispute among educators and scholars over two very different but equally legitimate approaches. One is called the separatist approach, which is an ethnocentric curriculum that emphasizes the perspective of one particular group in an effort not only to counterbalance the usual white male perspective, but also to raise the self-esteem and achievement of children from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds. The other is the pluralist approach, which seeks to account even-handedly for the contributions of various racial and ethnic groups within the existing academic framework. Now, the problem with this is that this is the not the correct way to frame this dispute. Because the problem is, the problem is, the problem is the existing academic framework. 
That is the problem. It is completely devoted to distorting the real facts about history, literature, art, music, drama, poetry, social science, and so forth. The next thing wrong about this argument is that it is not being given to the American public through the scholars themselves, but through ignorant journalists. Let me tell you about a couple of them. I mean, these people are just ignorant. There's no, no nice way to talk about it. Joan Beck, a columnist from the Chicago Tribune, wrote in the Pittsburgh Press the following. But many of those who tout self-esteem as the education answer of the 90s are letting it become a substitute for actual achievement. The, the I am somebody movement updated for the 90s is showing up in Afrocentric schools where the instruction is all themed around African and black culture rather than a Euro-Western curriculum that advocates say makes black youngsters feel inadequate. At their extremes, Afrocentric programs teach children that Africa is the source of many major scientific, mathematical, intellectual, and literary achievements, most of them stolen by whites who claim the credit. They stress the value of oral traditions and communication over repressive written language. One leader in the Afrocentric movement insists that whites are ice people, lacking the melanin in their skin that gives blacks the, the sun people an intellectual and humanistic edge. The dangers in this approach are obvious. Black children, as all children, deserve to be taught the truth. They need the logical skills to help them understand and evaluate what they are taught, end of quotation. Isn't that special? <laughs> the question, the question which is the crux of the matter is this, just what is the truth? And that's what we need to ask. Whenever you sit in any kind of forum and listen to anybody talk this stuff, ask them, what is the truth? Give us your evidence, because they don't have any. They just have quotations from each other. <laughs> Beck, yeah. Beck takes her text from scholars committed to the Aryan model or that paradigm of Western civilization. And these scholars called the ancient Egyptians white people in spite of the evidence to the contrary. With amazingly little and sometimes no evidence, their word through quotation is taken for, for, for truth. Now, the, 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 the professor she was talking about, of course, was, was Leonard Jeffries, the professor at City College of New York. And um, at no time, I've known, Lenny, I've known Lenny for a long, long time now, and I don't ever remember Lenny saying that we need uh, to um, uh, not be concerned about academic achievement. I, I've never heard him say that. Maybe somebody else has, but I've never, and I've been around Lenny a lot. Right? I've never heard him say that. Now, most of the, most of the uh, uh, people who say that are unwilling, however, to call Aristotle a racist. And even though Aristotle said similar things. For, so see, Aristotle's a good guy, and Lenny is a bad guy, even though they say the same thing. Because right. Martin Bernard says Aristotle said this, the races that live in cold regions and those of Europe are full of courage and passion, but somewhat lacking in skill and brain power. <laughs> well, I was not taught that Aristotle's a racist. They forgot to do that. Now, this other ignorant journalist named John Leo uh, on November the 12th, 1990, in U.S. News and World Report, he said, under the banner of multiculturalism, the rush is on to install an Africanized or Afrocentric curriculum in inner city schools. And he goes on and talks about the baseline essays in, in Oregon. He says, though many different plans are circulating, the most prominent of them is one that was developed for the Portland, Oregon schools in 1982. This outline, known as the African American Baseline Essays, has been used as a basic resource document by the city of Atlanta, and it is one of the models for programs that are currently being developed in Indianapolis, Prince George's County, Maryland, Washington, D.C. At the heart of the Baseline Essay, he says, is an unlikely claim, an unlikely claim, that consumes more than 35% of the curriculum's text. Ancient Egypt was a black nation. To gloss over black success, the baseline essays maintain Europeans invented the theory of white Egyptians who were merely brown by the sun. Experts do not seem to support this view. 
I phoned seven Egyptologists at random around the country, and all seven said it is completely untrue, then asked that their names not be used. <laughs> Education Week, November 28, 1990, reports that a number of Egyptologists disagree. They contend Egypt was a mixed-race society. Moreover, they say the concept of race was irrelevant to Egyptians who freely mixed with other cultures and ethnic groups. These social scientists, however, belong to the Aryan paradigm generated to defend slavery. Now, look, all of a sudden now, all these years they've been saying the Egyptians were white. Now they're getting these challenges from African, African scientists and scholars. Now they must say, no, well, we, we made a mistake. They're raceless. Uh, they're raceless. Well, if they're raceless, then they can't be white. Right? If they can't be black, they can't be white. But they're not retracting that they can't be white statements. You see, they want to have their cake and eat it too. Now, perhaps the greatest challenge was mounted by the brilliant genius Chekanta Dia who discovered a melanin test which proved that the mummies had black skins and then they wouldn't let him use it. His work is generally repressed in United States colleges and universities. The Chronicle of Higher Education, November 28, 1990, reports the need for a critical look at the field. In particular, they and others have faulted recent multicultural scholarship in this way. One, oversimplified rhetoric and literary theory has been substituted for an analysis of society. They must have been talking about Shelby Steele. <laughs> Two, a particularism has divided researchers into separate camps. Yes, the racist and the non-racist. And three, a political correctness which avoided self-criticism. Henry Louis Gates argues that minority critics are accepted by the academy, but in return, they must accept a role already scripted for them. Cornell West says that debates about the canon and academic curriculum have become substitutes for analysis of the problems of women and minority groups in the society. The issue is that multiculturalism further marginalizes minority groups. It appears that the power struggle is over definition. Who will determine what truth is? Who will then define the multiculturalism to reflect that truth? The winners will then determine what is the history. Europeans define others as they are discovered by them, and no group exists until it is found. The winners will then, I'm sorry, hence we plan to celebrate the 500th year of the Columbus discovery. John Leo and Joan Beck want to preserve this myth. They want to reject facts and cling to their myths. But like all good propagandists, they project their desire onto perceived enemies. Leo says the Afrocentric theory is a Tawana Brawley theory of history in which facts do not matter, only resentments and group solidarity. How does one describe then the history which we, tend, which we teach as illustrated by the Columbus distort distortion? Is this the Jesse Helm or David Duke theory of history? <laughs> What we need to think about is a national culture, one which is truly the United States or U.S. Neither Leo or his favorite professor, Miss Daisy Diane Ravage, want this. They want to claim that Eurocentric myths belong to all of us, even if they do lie. They want, they, one pluralist discussed her scheme for treating Thanksgiving with me. She taught third grade, and she said, I'm having a multicultural experiment. I'm going to let the Indians help the pilgrims to celebrate. So I said, big deal. I'm sure the Native Americans loved participating in the celebration of their subjugation and conquest. <laughs> now, in her article, Multiculturalism, yes, Particularism, no. Diane Ravitch argues that the debate over multiculturalism is one between those who promote cultural pluralism and those who demand loyalty to a particular group. The particularist approach to American culture can be seen most vividly in ethnic studies programs whose goal is to raise the self-esteem of students by providing role models. And listen to what she says. Such courses are animated by a spirit of filial pietism and by fundamentalist notions of racial and ethnic purity. From my point of view, 
The argument is between several filiopietic groups, ravages included, each of whom is in a war over the control of the definition of multiculturalism and the curriculum to be certain that that group's interests are defended and advanced. That is exactly why the state of Illinois mandated by law that the Jewish Holocaust be taught for six weeks every year, not the African American Holocaust, not the Native American Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust. What does Ravitch's esoteric categorization of political activities mean here? And why isn't she protesting that particularism? Additionally, she says that the pluralist approach which she advances accords with traditional academic ethics in that students learn to approach their subject with a critical eye. Give Barbara Ann a break. <laughs> So what would she say when her students brought her Diop's analysis of ancient Egypt, a point of view which she would call particularists? She argues that particularists want their adherents to believe in the subject rather than to know it. What do we do then about the Jewish Holocaust? It's very clear that everybody's out for self. Each group is out for its own best interests, and we need to get about that business. Education Week reports that Arthur Schlesinger, a leading critic of the ethnocentric approach, notes that the accusatory is, is disturbing. It says, the malicious misrepresentation of African society and people was to support the enormous profitability of slavery upon which the entire American agricultural economy depended. Ravage, yes, I have time. Uh -huh. Ravage supports this one. <laughs> Ravage, it's just now 11.30, okay, okay. I'm going to be finished in, in a minute. I don't have much left. Uh, the debate is over. Excuse me. The great tragedy of segregation is that it prevented us from knowing who the other person was. All right. Now, the Portland essay attempted to do that. It was clear Ravage did not want to hear that. That's not what you want to hear. You see, it's one thing to teach the Jewish Holocaust because the enemy was the brutal German, right? It's another thing to teach the African Holocaust or the Native American Holocaust because the enemy was the European American. And what they are trying to do is to forget it. Forget it. And if you start talking about it, you're bitter. Oh, you're so bitter. <laughs> in an arena where the chances of life for African Americans become worse and worse. What we need is a national culture. Fred Fanon defines it this way. A national culture is the whole body of efforts made by a people in the sphere of thought to describe, justify, and praise the action through which that people has created itself and keeps itself in existence. A national culture in underdeveloped countries should therefore take place at the very heart of the struggle for freedom which these countries are carrying on. If culture is the sum total of artifacts which a group creates in its struggle for survival, self-autonomy, and progress, then the national culture must reflect groups in conflict. Um, a Native American versus the European, African American versus the European, Mexicans versus the European, etc., etc., because it was the Europeans who came over here and upset everybody. Now, Harold Cruz agrees with Fanon, but poses a special American problem. You remember what he said about that? He talked about everybody having an identity problem, including white folks. He said, the fact of the matter is that American whites as a whole are just as much in doubt about their nationality, their cultural identity, as our Negroes. And that's the problem of Negro cultural identity is an unsolved problem within the context of an American nation that is still in, in process of formation. Fanon goes on to say, the intellectual who is Arab and French or Nigerian and English, when he comes up against the need to take on two nationalities, chooses if he wants to remain true to himself, the negation of one of these or the other. But most often, since they cannot or will not make a choice, such intellectuals gather together all the historical determining factors which have conditioned them and take up a fundamentally universal standpoint. I'm a human being. Yeah. <laughs> now, we do not have a cultural democracy in the United States. We just don't have one. And in order to create one, as Cruz warned in 1967, we must have a complete democratization of the national cultural ethos. And each group, just as the Jews have done with their Holocaust, must frame its own history. Now, before African Americans, however, can enter 
enter this struggle, we must produce our record of our history and our life and our culture because it has been suppressed and destroyed. So when people resent the fact that African American scholars are doing this work on ancient Egypt and all of that because they call it particularist, remember that someone has to do this work or we cannot enter that struggle. You can see why.